Welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Today we start a brand new series called Thank You. Thank You. Um, when I think about it, we have a lot to be thankful for. Do you agree with that? We have a lot to be thankful for, no matter who you are. And in fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, give thanks in all circumstances. All circumstances. It's easy to give thanks when things are going your way or you get a nice gift, but it's sometimes hard to be thankful when things aren't going your way, when it seems like that it's the opposite of what you want in life. It's important to learn to be thankful during those times. Many of you know that over, over a year ago, uh, I was uh, diagnosed with uh, radiculopathy and several different things that I don't know what it really means, but basically it affected my ability to walk, affected my muscles and my nerves from my back down to my legs. And last year during this month, I was in bed. Uh, the only way that I could get out was with help, and I had to have help to go to the bathroom. And I was in bed just about 24 hours a day, and then I went to a wheelchair, and then I went to a walker, and then I went to a cane. And of course now, not quite 100%, but I'm getting close, getting close, and I'm very thankful for that. But I told my wife, Kim, and this is a hard thing to do, I said, I'm thankful that God let me go through this. You say, how can you be thankful for that? Well, the, number one, the Bible says to do it. Uh, but number two, when I think about what this prepares me for, the fact is I believe that God is going to give us a ministry to people that need healing from God, that we're going to be able to pray over people, that people are going to be able to come and know Jesus as their Savior. And so when we look at that, it has increased my faith. And I believe as a result, will increase our church's faith. So it doesn't matter what difficult things you're going through. God said that we are to be thankful in all circumstances. Now, the interesting thing is in 1 Thessalonians 5, this is actually a spiritual discipline. So in other words, it's not related to how you feel, but it's related to the decision that you make and the faith that you have. So if uh, being thankful is a spiritual discipline, there are several other things that are listed in 1 Thessalonians 5 that are spiritual disciplines. Let me just read through those to you. Uh, to respect others is a spiritual discipline. Wow. In the political climate that we have today, learning to be respectful is a spiritual discipline. You may not feel like it. In fact, you might feel like slapping somebody whenever you watch the news. But respect is a spiritual discipline. To be a peacemaker. There's a difference between being a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. You know what a peacekeeper does? They placate. They don't necessarily stand for truth. They'll fold no matter what it is just to keep people from being angry or upset. But a peacemaker is a person that is proactive with the gospel. We're to be a peacemaker. That is a spiritual discipline. Uh, to work hard actually is in this list. Did you know that working hard can be a spiritual discipline? Now, you have to be careful that you don't work and depend on yourself. Uh, working hard is very important, but you can work too much and neglect your spiritual life and neglect your family or uh, neglect church. Uh, but the working hard is a spiritual discipline. Encouraging others, having patience, Forgiving and reconciling, that is in the list that Paul gives. Forgiving and reconciling with others is a spiritual discipline. You may not feel like forgiving people. In fact, if you feel like forgiving, you probably weren't hurt very deeply. The truth is, the deeper the hurt, the harder it is to release forgiveness. But when you release forgiveness, number one, it's a spiritual discipline. It's not an emotional feeling. So don't think you're a hypocrite if you say, well, I don't feel like I'm forgiving them. Speak the words. Speak the words and see what God does to release you. Okay? It's very important. Uh, reconciling and forgiving, praying, rejoicing. These are all spiritual disciplines. That's quite a list, to be honest with you. But we're going to focus on just one. Being thankful. One out of that list, to be thankful 
in all circumstances. Being thankful is a practice more than a feeling. I want you to understand that. Being thankful is a practice more than it is a feeling. There are times that I feel overwhelmed with emotion and thankfulness. And there are times that I have to just use a spiritual discipline to say thank you. And that shouldn't surprise us because every person here that has had children, you know that you have to force them to say thank you. Uh, Some kids are more pliable than others, but the majority of kids, when you say to them, say thank you, they're going to stub up, they're going to bow up, and they don't want to do it. I can't tell you the number of times that I had the candy or the toy taken away until I said, thank you. And you've done that as well as a parent. So it shouldn't surprise us, um, but a thankful attitude comes through practice. Practice. It's a spiritual discipline. So I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes on how to be more thankful this Thanksgiving. I'm going to read one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 100. And then I'm going to answer three questions from this psalm that shows us how we can be more thankful. Psalm 100, verse 1, it says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. I'm glad it said that because that means I can sing. Make a joyful noise. And don't get too judgy. I've heard some of you sing too. All right, it sounds like a noise, right? But aren't you glad that God doesn't require that you be uh, a, a top 10, you have a top 10 album out in order to sing to him, you can just make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Some Christians need to tell their face that it's okay to smile. Serve the Lord with gladness, not madness, but gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. In case you're wondering, it doesn't say this in the text, but if I were writing it, I would add this, he's God and you're not. That's kind of what he's indicating there. He's God. End of story. He's God. All right? And we can trust him. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Reminds me of Psalm 23 where God says that he leads us as the good shepherd beside still waters and into green pastures. Aren't you glad that God can give you peace? Aren't you glad that God can give you a little stillness in your mind? He can lead you beside still waters and green pastures. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. If that's all I had of scripture, if that's the only phrase that I could read from Holy Scripture, that would be enough. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. When things are not going my way, the Lord is good. When I think that I'm in pain, the Lord is is good. When I feel like my prayers are not being answered, the Lord is good. When my family is suffering or when I have a sickness that I did not expect, the Lord is good. And we can trust him. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. In other words, he's never going to stop being faithful. And he's never going to stop being good. And so I want to answer three questions from this text today. The first one is this, how should we worship? He gives us a description here in this passage that we read, Psalm 100, about how to worship. Uh, There's a couple things I want you to notice. Uh, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing, if you want to learn to worship, you got to learn to worship in faith. In faith. Did you know that worship is not just singing? It's not just sitting and listening to good music. Oh, those are important parts, but that's not all there is. Worship is an act of faith. When I am worshiping God, 
I am literally in faith calling out to him, giving my life to him, giving my circumstances to him in faithfulness, in thanksgiving, and I'm able to worship in faith. Did you know that the phrase there, uh, make a joyful noise, it literally meant a war cry. You ever watch those old movies where uh, maybe they're fighting with swords and uh, they're, they're getting ready to attack the enemy? Have you ever noticed that they, they all have this war cry? I don't know if you ever watched Braveheart, uh, but that's one of my top 10 movies of all time. And if you don't like Braveheart, I don't like you. All right, so I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, but it is a great movie. And in that movie, uh, Mel Gibson, his character, he leads them in this war cry, and I love it. I mean, they are giving it all they've got, and they're getting everybody fired up. And you know what the Bible says, how we're to worship God? It's like a war cry. Did you know that your singing, your worship, can mean encouragement to somebody else? Now I realize that at times that there are some people that aren't used to all that goes on in worship, and uh, sometimes people will be looking around like, oh my goodness, what is going on here? First time I ever went to a church that had very expressive worship, I was 10 years old. And uh, we just started going to this church, and I'll never forget it. There was a woman sitting behind me, and I was just minding my own business. I was behaving for a change in church. My parents told me that if I did not behave, I was going to get a spanking when I got home. So I'm sitting still. And all of a sudden, this woman behind me during the music, she stands up and she blurts out the biggest scream I've ever heard in my life. I literally just about jumped out of my skin. Scared me to death. And she's like, woo, woo, woo. And I'm like, oh, oh, I did not know what was going on. But you know what she was doing? She was letting out a war cry. And I learned that it was okay. Uh, first of all, it freaked me out. But uh, I, I learned that that was okay because you know what? Uh, we are in making a joyful noise to the Lord to worship Him. We're to worship Him with all of our heart. We're to worship in faith. Uh, James 1, 2 and 3 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So we're to worship in faith. And when we do that, God says we'll grow. Number two, we're to worship with joy. He said, serve the Lord with gladness. I love that phrase. Serve the Lord with gladness. Sometimes it's hard when you come from a, a difficult week and you come in church and you feel down, you kind of drug yourself to church anyway. Your kids are in the back seat of the car and they were fighting on the way to the church and you were just like, is this even worth it? Maybe you got in a fight uh, before you left the house. Um, I remember when uh, our kids were small, Kim would get frustrated at me because uh, she did get herself ready and all three of the kids ready, and I barely got myself ready. Uh, and so she get frustrated sometimes. And so you can come to church sometimes a little frustrated, a little, little frazzled, but when you get here, you come with joy. You say, well, uh, I'm not, I didn't have a joyful week. Well, when you begin to get your eyes on Jesus, and you begin to praise Him, and you begin to be thankful because it's a, it's a discipline it's a practice, not a feeling, then God will begin to fill you with joy. Romans 5, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That's important. Do you know why you can have joy and peace? It's not because of the world around you. It's because you believe in Jesus. Do you know how you can overcome a bad week? Do you know how you can begin to praise him? It's through believing. He says he gives us this joy and this peace when we believe. You know what that tells me? That even when I don't feel like it, if I can just say some wonderful things about Jesus, what I thank God for about him, what I am so praising him for, that it'll begin to fill my life with joy and peace, even when I don't feel like it. And he says, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. 
You want to have more hope in your life? You want to have more hope in a hopeless world? Just begin to praise God. Begin to be thankful. Begin in faith to worship Jesus. It'll make a difference. And then we worship with singing. This is an interesting thing. He said, come into his presence with singing. He did not say you had to be a good singer. He said, come into his presence with singing. I got to make a confession. My mother is without doubt the worst singer in the history of the world. She cannot even come close to getting the tune of Jesus Loves Me Right. She is completely tone deaf, but she is a wonderful mother. And she used to try to sing to me, and I think as a baby it made me cry, all right? Uh, some mothers sing to soothe their children, and my mother, when she sang, everybody cried because it was so terribly bad. But you know what she learned to do, even though she could not carry a tune, and even to this day, and I love her, I'm going to go see her at Thanksgiving, praise God for her. She's 76 years old. She loves Jesus, and she loves to sing, and we cringe every time she sings. But you know what I love about her? Many things, but I love the fact that in spite of she didn't have a very good voice, God thinks she's got a beautiful voice. You know why? She sings. She sings to him. And she's not worried about what everybody else thinks around her. She's singing to him. We worship with singing. And I want to challenge you. Maybe you come to church and you don't sing. And I'm not saying that you're a bad person if you don't. I realize some people are shy and you don't want people to hear you. Okay? Because maybe you and my mom could be in the duet and just make the paint peel. Okay? But I want to challenge you. Even if you don't like singing... Even if you're not very good at singing, you know what the Bible tells us we should do? We should sing. Now, for some of you, I give you permission to sing in the shower, all right? Uh, you say, well, if I sang at church, all the children will cry. Well, sing in the shower, all right? Sing somewhere because he says, come into his presence with singing. Why does he say that? Because singing does something to our soul. Singing expresses to God. And when I sing, I'm worshiping and praising him. I worship with singing. Uh, Colossians 3.16, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. It's about Jesus, okay? Well, he's saying sing, and he's not saying sing a Guns N' Roses song, okay? Now, I've got to be honest. I get a blessing out of Guns N' Roses. I love that band. It's my favorite band from the 80s. The other day, I... I don't know what I was doing, but I, I got online and started looking at something on YouTube, and I watched the Guns N' Roses YouTube video, and then I watched that for a while, and then I watched Def Leppard. Uh, I'm kind of letting you into my world a little bit of the kind of music that I liked growing up, and then I watched Aerosmith, and then I watched, and afterwards, I was just elated and filled with joy. Now, I wasn't worshiping Jesus, and I'm not suggesting that uh, that causes you to worship Jesus, but I am saying singing does something to us. And so he said, if you want to be uplifted, let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. And then notice how he says to do this, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. You want to have a better week? You want to have a better day? Sing to him. You're not singing to me. You're not singing to your family. You're not singing to the people you work with. You're singing to him. And when I do that, I worship him and I'm thankful. And then we worship with gladness. This is how we're supposed to worship God. Worship with gladness. Psalm 16 and 11, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You want to get in on the pleasure, the joy, worship him. That's what he says. And when I do that, he shows me the path of life. Isn't that interesting? The path of life. The decisions I should make. The way I should go. That, way, that word path gives the idea of a way, a way of walking, a way of living. You want to do the right thing? You want to have a better relationship with God? You want to have more joy? Worship Him. He says, 
that it's a gift. We worship with gladness. Now, here's the second question I want to answer from this text. Number two, why do we worship? We saw how, but number two, why do we worship? Why does he say worship him? Well, he says there, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. You know the number one reason we worship him? It's right there in the verses we read. The number one reason we worship him is because he's God and we're not. He's God and we're not. And I love that because you know what that tells me is that he is in control. In spite of how I feel about my circumstances, he is in control. Why do I worship? Because he's God. He's God. And when I learn to do that, then my life is better, and I'm more thankful for the things that God has done in my life. Uh, the word know, know that he is God is an interesting word. It means this, to acknowledge that he is God, acknowledge it, know it. But what that means is that this is a confession or a creed. And so the, the thing I love about this is that it doesn't have anything to do with my circumstances. It doesn't have anything to do with the way I feel. But as a creed, you know what a creed is? It's a confession of faith. And so when I say he is God, you know what I'm doing? I'm confessing by faith that I believe that he's God and that he's good and that he's in control. And I may not be in control and I may not understand, but I know that he is God. And whenever you are in a difficult circumstance, just confess this creed. I know that you are God. I know that you're in control. I know that you know where I am. I know you know what I'm going through. Amen? When I begin to understand that, I can worship him better. And then I want you to see that the ancient Israelites... When they did this psalm, they would say this psalm, they would sing this psalm out loud many times going to the temple to worship God. Uh, but when they would sing this song, um, they understood when they said that he is God, we know that you are God and we are your people. I want you to see there was a twist that in modern English we don't really get. Because what they were saying was that they didn't merely see God as the creator of humankind. They acknowledged that. He's the creator of humankind. But what they saw was that he created them to be his people. Now, what that means is he pulled them from a life of slavery. If you know your Old Testament, you know that the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, right? They had all the disadvantages, all the hardships, all the pain. And God reached down and delivered them to be his now, I want you to see the beautiful picture, because what God is doing here, what they acknowledged was that in their darkest of days, in the most painful times in their life, they were the most unlikely people in the world to be chosen by God. But you know what God did? He reached down and as creator he made them his own people. You know what that's a picture of? That's a picture of salvation. It's a picture that whosoever will may come. It's a picture that you don't have to have money to be God's people. You don't have to have prestige to be one of God's people. You don't have to be even a very good person to be one of God's people. Because you know what he does? He takes the dejected, the rejected the sinners, those that are far from God, those that are enslaved by sin, those that are enslaved by their pain and by this world, and he reaches down and he takes those people, the outcasts, the people that nobody else thinks could be of any value, and he makes those people his people. I love that. And you know what he does? This is what's so beautiful about this. He'll do the same for you. Isn't that good news? So when I say he's God, you know what I'm doing? I'm acknowledging that he's the Savior, and I'm not. 
I'm acknowledging that it is the gospel. It is his grace that makes all the difference in the world. That's why I'm to worship him. Um, And then we worship him because we are his. We're his family and his people. And then here's the last question. And this is a very serious question. And I want you to answer this question in light of what the Bible says. Not your feelings, but what does the Bible say? And here's the question. Is it important to worship at church? According to Scripture, is that important? Well, let's look at what he, he wrote there, David. He said, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Did you know that entering the gates, that was referring to entering the temple gates? In other words, the house of God. And so how we could read this was, enter God's house with thanksgiving. You know what the New Testament says about your body, that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit once you get saved, that the Holy Spirit indwells you. But you know what it also says? That the church is the embodiment, the indwelling place of the Holy Spirit. You know what the word church, and I, I, was, I started off the next step class this morning, we had a, a room full of people uh, going through the next step class, which was great. And I was just kind of telling them, you know what the word church means? It means gathering. That's all it means. It means the gathering. Now, there's the big C church, which is the worldwide body of Christ, the worldwide believers. And then there's the little C church, which he is referring to, to us, that he wants us to gather together with other believers. Very, very important. And so if I'm going to enter his gates, that simply means I go to church. That's all it means. Go to church with thanksgiving. That's how we could translate that. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. It doesn't matter what you're going through. The Lord is good. And he says his steadfast love, his mercy endures forever. Forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Entering the house of the Lord, that's what we do when we go to the church today. So he says, it's important to worship, it's important to sing, it's important to be glad at all times, but he has this caveat, don't just do it on your own, enter his gates, come to church. Now I realize I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here in church, those of you online, you're joining us online in church, I get it, okay? But it shows us how important that actually is for us. We're to worship at church. We're to worship with thanksgiving. And the starting point is always, always, always his goodness, his grace, and his faithfulness. That's what he tells us. So the next time you have a bad week and you don't really feel like being too thankful, remember it's a practice, not an emotion. Now, there can be emotions involved with it, but if you want to do it, it's a spiritual discipline. So even when you have a bad day, even when you have a wreck, even when you get a pay cut, even when one of your kids fails a class or grade and you have to talk about summer school, oh my, driving them to summer school, what a, what a bummer, okay? But no matter what's going on in your life, you give thanks in every situation, you worship him, you bring that attitude of thankfulness to him because of who he is, and we don't just do it at home, we do it at church too. And I could flip it too. We don't just do it at church, but we do it at home too. You see, there are some people that they get it wrong one way or the other. Some people, they're like, well, I don't have to go to church to worship God. And that's true. You can worship God at home. But the Bible is very explicit and very clear. You do need to go to church. I mean, you cannot read scripture without coming to that conclusion. Okay. But then there are people that get the opposite. They'll do it at church. And then they're like, hey, I've checked church off my box for this week. I'm good. I don't have to think any Jesus thoughts until next Sunday. And both of those is such, um, it lets you down as a believer. 
It's a disappointment. You may not even realize it. It's a disappointment for your own life. And it's not an upgrade. It's a downgrade. It's a, it's a problem unless you do both. So I'm to worship at church. I'm to worship at home. Uh, but the starting point is always not just, look, we should be thankful for everything. The Bible's clear about that. So when you're thankful for your car, that's a biblical thing to do. When you're thankful that you can walk and see and hear, that, that's a good thing to do. It's biblical, okay? But if all, if all you do is focus on the material, you're going to, at times, run out of things to be thankful for. Because on one hand, you can be thankful for a car, and on the other hand, when it continuously breaks down and it dips into your bank account and you cannot get the thing to run right and you don't want to get upside down in another car and you've made that determination and you're frustrated... What are you going to do? Well, in all circumstances, give thanks. But also, here's what he says, that we've got to learn to focus on more than just the material in life. More than just, I had a good day. These are things to be thankful for, don't get me wrong. But when we really become truly thankful and truly worship, we focus on his goodness, his grace, and his faithfulness. And then, when the car breaks down, you can still have joy. And then, when the doctor gives a bad report, you can still have peace. Okay? Why? Because we're not focusing on the material. Now, don't get me wrong. You should be thankful for that. The Bible's clear. But that's just not even the starting point. That's the peripheral. That's the extra. That's the whipped cream on top. You know what the main course is? Jesus. Jesus. And when I'm thankful for his goodness and his grace that endures forever, and I'm thankful for his faithfulness that he's never going to let me down, he's never going to leave me or forsake me, I have a starting point to be able to worship God in a way that helps me be more thankful at Thanksgiving. I hope that is your prayer today when you focus on God as a spiritual practice or a discipline. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us to be more thankful this Thanksgiving. Not just Thanksgiving, but every day of our lives. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to begin by focusing on Jesus. And I hope that you will help each of us this week in particular to be more thankful. Let us shut out the noise, those that mock God, those that even mock the idea of being thankful. I pray that you'd help us to focus on Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. Before I finish my prayer, I wonder, I'm going to ask you two questions today. Number one, what is God saying to you today? I wonder, is God saying to you, I need to be more thankful? Would you just raise your hand? Is that you today? I need to be more thankful. I've got my hand up, okay? Yeah, all of us could do more of that. And then I wonder today if you would online or in the room say, I need Jesus as my Savior. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's Jesus that does the saving. The Holy Spirit does the drawing. I don't do any of it. He does it all. But I put my faith in his finished work on the cross. And so today, if you would like to call out on him, I want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you'd say, Pastor I'm receiving Jesus today. And you pray something like this. Dear God, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He's the Savior. I believe that He did everything necessary on the cross for my salvation. And I'm not depending on my goodness, my morality, or any of my deeds. I'm depending on you by faith. And I'm asking you to give me the faith to trust you, Lord, that even the faith comes from you. And I thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Now, I wonder today if you'd say, Pastor, I pray to receive Christ today. If you're online, please click at the bottom of the screen that you pray to receive Christ. And if you'll do this, if you'll fill out the next step card that's online and put on there that you pray to receive Christ, we can help you with your next step. I wonder if anybody in the room with heads bowed, you'd say, Pastor, I receive Christ today. Uh, before today, I was not a Christian. Before today, I didn't know. Before today, I had doubts. But I prayed today, and I got it settled to trust Christ as my Savior today. Today. 
Would you raise your hand? Anybody in the room today that uh, did that or wants to do that today? I would encourage you, if you prayed in the room today to receive Christ, that you'd fill out a next step card. I'll be standing on the blue carpet on the other side of that wall after the service, and uh, you can give it to me, all right? Father, thank you. Help us to be more thankful in every circumstance. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.